Well, let's see if we can get comfortable here. Hi, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. And welcome. Oh, hello. Hi. Oh, what is it? Welcome to another, uh, should we say, installment of our um, weekly good natured meetings. Got a whole lot to cover tonight. Um, and I've actually got a couple of show and tells here at the end that I want to share with you. So uh, let's see if we can get the old screen share going tonight. All right, let's start this from the beginning. So, um, Let's start off, uh, even though we're officially into spring now, we're gonna take a look back for a few minutes at uh, the winter time. Uh, if you were able to read last week's column, you know that I uh, talked a little bit about some of our uh, signs of spring, the spring wildflowers that we all look for, even the, uh, the planted flowers that we put in our yards, our ornamentals like crocus and uh, daffodils, those are all starting to spring up and pop. Uh, and while all that's going on, though, there's there's some other subtle, more subtle signs of the arrival of spring that actually have to do with the departures. Um, now, uh, in the article, I, I mentioned several things, um, but I led up to uh, these birds here because I think they're the bird that we most associate uh, with the winter season uh, here in Illinois. Uh, sometimes these birds are called snowbirds even, but it's our uh, juncos. And uh, juncos um, as a, as a uh, group or as a species are, are really interesting birds. In fact, if you um, uh, get a chance to go over to YouTube, there was uh, a few years back uh, a documentary that was put together about juncos and how this one species has divided itself into uh, seven or eight different subspecies, uh, all with slightly different habits, but sharing the same uh, genetic material that makes them all very, very closely related. Um, in our area, uh, they're all referred to as dark-eyed juncos, but then there's all these different species. And in our area, we have what's called the slate-colored dark-eyed junco. That's what uh, predominates in the, the eastern Midwest, um, uh, the east coast and the Midwest. And um, to, to look at the birds, um, you can kind of tell they're uh, a type of sparrow just by their, their general um, outline, uh, the, the seed eating bill and um, their smallish shape. Uh, if you look a little more closely uh, at the, uh, the coloration, you can start to tell the differences between the males and the females. The, the males, a mature male will usually have a, a darker uh, plumage on top and the females tend to be a little bit uh, a more lighter gray and even sometimes will have some brown uh, in them. Now, um, if we look at our map, uh, we see that they do not uh, stay here year round. This is uh, very much a part of their wintering habitat here in Northern Illinois. But um, within that range that we're looking at here, uh, there's some kind of interesting things going on. Um, there was a study done several years ago that looked at the makeup of the, uh, the wintering population of the uh, slate colored dark eyed junco. And what they found was that the birds that are uh, wintering up here in the northern part of that winter range tend to be more heavily populated with males. And the farther south the go, you go, the more females you see. Um, the study pointed out a couple of interesting implications of that. One is that uh, males, well, for one thing, you know, males are more often than not, they're the ones that are in charge of setting up a breeding territory. And it kind of makes sense that uh, if, you've, uh, if you think of it as a commute, if the males um, don't fly so far south, then they don't have to fly 
as far back north, which ensures that they might get back sooner and also um, are then able to you know, secure the, the, the better uh, or um, better uh, provisioned breeding territories. So that's one advantage and one reason why uh, we might see more males in this area. Uh, the other thing is a, is a physiological adaptation that males appear to have. And that's that they're a little bit uh, larger um, in a, a bird that has more mass uh, can withstand colder temperatures for longer. They can pack in just a little bit more in the way of, of uh, fat reserves. Although birds, by and large, they don't, they can't really carry around a whole lot of fat or they wouldn't be able to fly. But uh, the larger body mass of the male uh, makes it possible for them to uh, withstand the colder temperatures of this northern part of the winter range. Uh, so I just thought that was kind of an interesting thing. And if you happen to travel south in the winter, uh, like the Juncos, but if you, if you go down farther south in northern Illinois, you might look around and see um, if you notice that there are more females in the lower, uh, more southern parts of that um, migra uh, migration air, uh, habitat that they have. <laughs> Now, um, over here on the right, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Those are some of the subspecies I was mentioning. Uh, some are uh, concentrated up here in the Pacific Northwest. We've got some that are uh, distinctly Western in their uh, habits. Uh, but again, what we tend to see in our area here is what's called the slate-colored dark-eyed junco. Now, they are uh, by any means the only birds that uh, we only see here in the wintertime. Here's uh, some examples. The, the tree sparrow, American tree sparrow, um, spends its uh, winter here. The white-throated and the white-crowned sparrows, uh, they uh, migrate through here, um, but oftentimes will spend the winter even a little bit farther south than northern Illinois. You can catch these guys around here, but um, they will migrate. We see them. Uh, more of them in the uh, the spring and fall during the migrations. Um, the American tree sparrow, you might be looking at that going, well, gee whiz, that looks an awful lot like a chipping sparrow. But if, if we break it down, we can see there's some differences. It, it does have a rufous cap like we see on the chipping sparrow. But look here on the breast, we've got a little bit of streaking here. And then we've got this little uh, spot here that I learned uh, to call the tie tack. It's a, just a, a, a dark spot in the middle of the breast. Um, and again, the time of year that you're seeing this bird doesn't really line up. Uh, our chipping sparrows, uh, they're back now. I've heard a few of them uh, uh, singing in my neighborhood, so I know they're getting ready to breed. Uh, but the, uh, the tree sparrows, um, uh, they're on their way out and heading back north again because they breed much farther north from here. Um, the white, you know, white-throated and white-crowned sparrows. You know, for a long time before I, I had a decent pair of binoculars, I used to get kind of vexed by these guys because to me they looked really similar. The stripes on the head made me think of the stripes on the old um, University of Michigan football helmets. Now, granted, those were uh, the the navy and gold colors. Um, and these are black and white. By and large, there are some um, variations in the colors. We have a, a, a brownish stripe pattern that we see sometimes too. But um, that, that bold striping, I, I, I could not for the life of me uh, tell the two apart. But if we start to look at them more closely, we do see that the white-throated sparrow does indeed have a white throat. Um, it's also got yellow here on the lores. Uh, this is also a bird. Remember last week when we talked about um, uh, the song sparrow learning to sing, uh, and it has tutors that it learns to mimic, and so there's a lot of variation in um, song sparrow songs. Uh, we kind of see that with white-throated sparrows too. I, I learned the white-throated sparrow song as poor Sam Peabody, Peabody, Peabody. But some of you might have learned it as oh Canada, Canada, Canada. Um, sometimes they throw in a few extra Canadas, sometimes they cheat us and they only give us a couple, but um, we will hear variation. Um, and they do tend to sing during their migrations. So, so these are birds. Um, and I, I should also mention the other thing, just the concept of sparrows and all the different kinds was something that took me a few years to wrap my head around because I grew up 
learning that, you know, those brown birds, those are all sparrows and all those birds in the water, those are all ducks. And, but once you, once you get into birding, you either love this part or you hate this part where you start to apply uh, kind of a checklist in your head to look for all these different details. Uh, does it have a streaky breast or a clear breast? Are there any markings uh, anywhere on the breast? Is there a line through the eye? Um, what's the coloring of uh, the, the um, cap on the head? What color are the legs? All these different things come together to help us identify these different types of sparrows. Now, um, looking at that range map and, and seeing, well, you know, juncos are here in the winter and they go north in the summer. We do that as humans, but it doesn't mean the birds always read those field guides. Um, one of the birds I mentioned in the column is being here in the winter, but then taking off um, and breeding farther north of here is the common merganser. Um, well, there's nothing like uh, having readers who keep you honest. This is a video that I received from a reader in uh, Sugar Grove, and she said that she took it uh, last May on May 21st. What do we have here but a uh, common merganser? and her little flotilla of uh, babies following behind her. So clearly these birds did not um, migrate uh, up to, uh, you know, th those birds can't even fly yet. They are, uh, so, so obviously this little family um, is Illinois born and bred. Um, and I was, I was really excited to see this. Um, I'm not going to draw any inferences about climate change or anything like that. Instead, I'm going to reflect back on an experience I had, uh, gosh, shortly after I started here at the Park District. So maybe 2008, 2009, something like that. Um, I was learning about all the parks in our park system. And I traveled to this one here. Uh, it's called Riverside Park. And it's, uh, it's our most uh, south uh, southerly. <laughs> the park is really far south in St. Charles. It's right on the line, um, the dividing line between uh, St. Charles and Geneva, which is Division Street. Bennett Street is Route 25, so we're talking about the east side of the Fox River. Um, this was a park that um, years ago used to have a, a playground and some picnic tables and things like that, but it was really hard for residents to use because it was always wet there. It turns out um, this uh, there's kind of a slope or a hill as you go away from the river. So um, as you head towards the river, uh, all the water that rolls down off of that slope um, kind of collects in this area. There's also some seeps and springs through here. So it's very, very wet. Uh, so uh, a number of years ago, the park district decided, you know what, we're going to quit trying to mow this. We're going to quit trying to main this, maintain this as a neighborhood park. We're going to make this into a natural area. And so here's um, uh, an aerial view. Uh, here uh, you can see we've got a wooded area here. This is the Fox River bike trail that goes uh, between the natural area and the shoreline of the Fox River. Well, I was walking along here one day and I looked uh, into the water here and what do I think I see, but um, common merganser female and her little ones swimming behind her. Uh, now, I didn't have binoculars with me. I didn't have a camera. In fact, at that time, I don't even know if I had a cell phone that was capable of taking pictures and certainly not video, but um, I, I saw it. I knew it wasn't a mallard. It wasn't a wood duck. Um, it sure as heck looked like a merganser, but I just didn't think that they were around in the summertime. Uh, but now, thanks to our, our reader in Saint, um, out in Sugar Grove, I'm kind of thinking that maybe I did see that. Uh, common mergansers tend to nest in um, cavities in trees, and there's certainly um, a lot of dead wood to be found in this area. Uh, there's a few dead trees in this tree line up here to the north, and then to the south here, there's uh, kind of a floodplain forested area that's got um, numerous dead trees that have some pretty good cavities in them as well. So now I'm thinking that maybe all these years later, uh, that is what I, I saw. And maybe it's something you want to try and find too. I, I kind of now want to go back to Riverside as we get into springtime and uh, as we start seeing ducklings out on the river, see if I can find another set of uh, another family of, of common mergansers. 
Um, this was an area, uh, this kind of gives you an idea too of what the shoreline there looks like. We do a little bit of mowing there. Um, that's primarily because it's kind of an easement there off of the bike trail. Uh, we did a cleanup there last fall. Found some pretty astounding things in the river, by the way. Um, we even pulled out a, a full-size uh, comforter that, um, gosh, it must have weighed I don't know, 30 pounds or so, and it had a lot of fish hooks in it from people who had gotten uh, their lines caught in it. But anyway, this kind of gives you an idea of the naturalized uh, shoreline that we have there. And um, this path here is um, available for you to walk on. If you happen to see a common merganser there uh, breeding this summer, please let me know. Like I said, I, I hope to get over there and check it out too. Now, that kind of, uh, speaking of shorelines, we're going to talk about another uh, river denison, the muskrat. Um, I always think of springtime as muskrat season for some reasons that we'll get to uh, in just a few minutes, but I, I wanted to give you just an overview of the species itself. These are very, very common, and as you can tell by the name uh, muskrat, they, they are rodents. They've got uh, the two large incisors and the back molars, uh, but not a lot of other teeth. Uh, so they're very, very good at chewing. They're also very good at reproducing, although they don't reproduce on a scale of say a mouse or a vole, um, but they have uh, several young every year. And thanks to uh, A, our river uh, and creek uh, habitat that we have uh, throughout the Fox River Valley. And then also all the uh, retention ponds that we've created for all the developments we have around here. Muskrats have a lot of habitat to choose from. Uh, you might have seen structures like this. Now, I have to say I'm a little bamboozled. I took this, this uh, photo several years ago on uh, Wenmouth Road, just south of Fabian Parkway in uh, what I guess would be Geneva, or at least Geneva Township. And there were muskrat huts all over that area. Um, muskrats, uh, when the habitat is right, they will chew down uh, the stalks and stems of cattails and they build these large vegetative uh, little huts. Some people uh, call them lodges, some people call them huts. Um, that's the big difference uh, between what a beaver builds and, and what a muskrat builds is what that, uh, that structure is made of. If, um, if it's all herbaceous materials and mud and um, smaller, uh, about the size of maybe a doghouse, that is uh, the work of a muskrat. If it's uh, bigger, uh, much larger, uh, taller, sometimes as tall as a human, um, and made out of woody materials with mud, then we know we're looking at the work of a beaver. Um, but th these uh, muskrat huts, I, I haven't seen muskrats uh, in that area the last few times I've driven along there. Now, maybe I'm just driving too fast, I'm not paying attention, but um, I'm not exactly sure if all those huts are still there. But I remember uh, people used to write me and say, what is it that's living in that marsh? there off of Wenmouth, there's so many little homes there. Well, that is what a muskrat will build when the habitat suits it. Now, along the river um, and in, in certain other areas too, uh, um, and I don't really know how muskrats decide which is more appropriate, probably has to do with the, the shoreline and, and the makeup of the banks, but uh, muskrats will also excavate and live in a bank just the same way a, a beaver will. They'll, uh, they always want to make sure that the entrance to their little home, whether it's a hut or whether it's a bank burrow, um, they always want to make sure the entrance is under the water because that really limits the number of predators that can gain access. Um, so uh, um, you know, a, a mink might attempt that, but certainly a coyote would not and a fox would not. Um, so they, they kind of keep themselves safe uh, by doing that. They also, they, they do not hibernate in the wintertime. Uh, they swim around underneath uh, the ice. And so the, again, being able to enter the water, uh, below the water surface is very, very important to their survival in the wintertime as well. Now, when um, a muskrat moves, uh, their feet, they don't have web feet. For, for an animal that spends as much time as they do in the water, you'd think that they would have just 
big webs and they'd be powering themselves around using their legs. Well, their legs are really short. So it makes more sense to get um, a paddle working for them. And in the muskrat's case, their paddle takes the form of a tail that is um, vertically flattened. So, you know, a beaver has a big flat, horizontally flattened tail, um, but a beaver also has webbed feet and that's how it propels itself. Its back feet are really large and it, it uh, paddles its way around using uh, those feet to push itself forward. Well, a muskrat uh, sways its tail back and forth to push itself forward. I got a really good view of this one time. And, and again, it was, it was before I had a cell phone that could take video or at least before I knew how to take a video with my cell phone. Uh, but I, I was standing on a bridge above a creek and a muskrat came uh, swimming along and it was swishing that tail back and forth. And it's, it's really amazing how much power they can gain by using that vertically flattened tail to push uh, itself forward. Now, um, as I mentioned, they do swim um, year round. They have a, a really cool adaptation. Oh, I forgot I put this in here. Here shows how that tail is, is flattened um, vertically. So it's not round. You'd think it would have a, its name is muscle. It would make sense that its tail would be round, but it's like a rat's, but it's, it's not. It's vertically flattened. And that's the source of its propulsion there in the water. Now, um, here, Jerry, I have to thank you for this photo. This photo, uh, our viewer Jerry took back a few months ago. I believe this was near the Chicago River. This is a Chicago muskrat. Look at that luxurious fur. That is one key to the muskrat survival in, in cold temperatures. They uh, at one time, their pelts were uh, considered almost as valuable as that of the beaver. They've got uh, guard hairs as well as a thick undercoat that helps insulate and keep them warm. Um, but they've got another thing they do, and I, I, I got to tell you, I don't know the, the physiology behind it, but muskrats, uh, before they dive into water that's very cold, they can actually raise their body temperature a couple of degrees. Must have something to do with being able to, to control their metabolism or, or something, but they, as much as two degrees, their body temperature will rise before entering cold water. Uh, that gives them a little bit of extra time uh, swimming around before they have to start burning uh, fat to keep warm. And it's, uh, it's something that uh, they share with beavers as a cold weather adaptation for um, living in climates such as ours. Kind of a cool thing, huh? Now, I mentioned that I think of um, early spring as muskrat season. And yes, I apologize. I should have put a warning. Uh, you know, sensitive viewers might want to look away. This is a dead muskrat. And this is the time of year when we see this. I took this picture in March a few years ago. Uh, I took it actually because it, this muskrat was in a really weird spot. It was on 6th Street here in St. Charles. And at the time, I was wondering what in the world is a muskrat doing on 6th Street, six blocks from the river. Um, but knowing now how these animals uh, travel around using storm sewers and such, I, I, I still don't know how it got out of the storm sewer, but I kind of think that might have played a role in having it uh, come so far away from the river as it did um, before it met its demise. March is what I call the muskrat massacre season because I know it's an ugly term. Uh, it's something that, that we see here in suburbia. As I mentioned before, their, uh, their habitat is, is, is grown with our uh, creation of so many different retention ponds in the area. Uh, well, muskrats, as they go into the breeding season, the parents kick out the young from last year, like little um, sissy and little junior. They get to stay with mom and dad uh, for almost a year. Or actually, yeah, just about a year. But as they're approaching maturity, mom and dad have another um, litter coming very, very soon. So they send the youngsters off on their way. Um, a lot of them um, are looking for their own uh, new territories. And a lot of them have never crossed the street before. And a lot of them make some bad decisions. I remember, um, I think this was in 2018, I was uh, walking in the St. Charles St. Patrick's Day Parade. So it was whatever Saturday that was close to uh, March 17th that year. And here we were, we were walking down Main Street in St. Charles, 
was crossing uh, right by the, uh, the Baker Hotel, right by the Fox River. And what's smack dab in the middle of Main Street in St. Charles, but a very flat, a very dead muskrat. So uh, if you see a weird roadkill at this time of year, if it's got a uh, long and uh, flattened tail, <laughs> The whole thing's probably going to be flat. Let's face it. If it's if it's been run over several times, but if you see something with a, a you know, virtually hairless tail, uh, this rich, rich and luxurious uh, muskrat fur, chances are uh, you're looking at a muskrat that did um, make a bad decision. Muskrat is not a common roadkill at the rest of other times of the year. It's it's usually only in the spring that we see this. So anyway, just something to keep in mind while you're out driving about, maybe playing around a. Uh, Roadkill bingo, put muskrat on your card because now's the time to see it. Um, one other weird thing about muskrats is that they are, if you look at uh, food chain uh, diagrams that are from uh, aquatic ecosystems, 99 times out of 100, you're going to see that muskrats are classified as herbivores. And that's with good reason. Uh, their diet is about 95% plant material. Uh, but these guys, every once in a while, they skip the salad bar and they go for mussels uh, and they eat a lot of mussels at one time. Um, I know the tendency around here when you see a, a, a bunch of dead mussels like that is to think that it was raccoons that fed on these things, but it's, it was probably not raccoons because raccoons are not nearly as aquatic as muskrats. Uh, muskrats can actually forage for mussels um, by swimming down along the bottom of uh, whatever the body of water is and feeling with their sensitive front paws. And um, they don't always come up with a mussel. Sometimes they come up with rocks, but you can see they are pretty good at what they do. And you'll find areas uh, up and down the Fox River and some of our um, Creeks that have better water quality, uh, Big Rock Creek, uh, Fearson Creek, uh, we'll see these what we call midden piles. And these are signs of uh, muskrats that have been feeding. I remember one time running into a, a gentleman who worked for the Army Corps of Engineers. He was based uh, at uh, Fairport, uh, the Fairport Fishery uh, over on the uh, eastern side of Iowa along the uh, Mississippi River actually just a little bit north of Muscatine. He was actually studying, um, he was, he, he was a, I believe a, a mechanical engineer with the Army Corps, but in his spare time, he was doing all this research into freshwater mussels and muskrat ecology, how they, these two uh, different uh, groups of animals interact. And he had all sorts of data. I wish I could get my hands on it about how many dives a muskrat would take uh, before it would find a mussel. And then he was also trying to determine if they had favorite species or if they just fed uh, randomly on whatever mussels they could find. But um, I just think it's really interesting that uh, a muskrat, a rodent, and rodents by and large are uh, herbivores, that these guys have a taste for freshwater mussels. Now, um, this movement has been getting more and more momentum over the last few years. Uh, maybe one um, version of it is leave the leaves, but it's, it's the idea of not cleaning up your yard in the fall or not first thing in the springtime either. I know we all want to get rid of the dead plant stems and let the, uh, the new growth uh, of our plants in our yards start popping up. But there is a lot of life in those older stems. And it's, it's kind of neat to see um, just how many different animals will take advantage of it. So it's, it's one, by leaving stems up, uh, whether it's, it's a, a, a prairie grass or maybe it's something larger. On the right here, these were uh, some great angelica stems at Hickory Knolls. And on the left, this is some, uh, some elderberry. Um, but a lot of insects will use these stems uh, for, they either lay eggs in there, and so there are uh, larvae or pupae that are overwintering inside those stems. A lot of our native bees will use uh, plant stems to lay their eggs and provision little chambers uh, for their larvae and pupae. Um, so the insects use them, and then the things that eat insects use them. 
all of the holes we're looking at here, this is all birds. So birds have been onto this trend probably for uh, millennia, well, probably for as long as insects have been doing it and as long as we've had birds, they have been uh, hip to this idea that uh, there's good eats inside of these stems. So uh, by leaving the stems up, we're not only um, giving the insects a place to overwinter, but we're also giving birds something to eat. So if you're like me and you don't like to be uh, tied to a, a bird feeder that you have to fill every day or every week and you don't have to clean uh, every few days or weeks, um, planting your yard with native vegetation like this kind of takes care of some of that for you because it's, it's providing uh, homes for insects, which then in turn provides foods for birds. Um, now I've got a cool book, it's called uh, Thoreau's Method. And it's got uh, a lot of, uh, each chapter kind of delves into a different aspect of nature. And um, one chapter in particular delves into the life of the, the goldenrod. And they talk about the galls and the investigations you can do into the, the what lives uh, in those galls, these lumps that we see on our goldenrod stems. So, um, on the right here, this is a, a, a goldenrod gall. It's the work of the uh, gall fly, as we see here on uh, the left. Tiny little creature, um, probably uh, not a whole lot bigger than a mosquito. Heavier body, uh, highly patterned wings, but uh, so you, you're not going to confuse them with a mosquito. But you know they're, they're not very big. Uh, the female uh, gall fly will lay her eggs on the uh, plant stems of uh, goldenrod, and that causes the plant to, uh, the, the, uh, the chemicals uh, that the, the female puts around her egg uh, causes the, uh, the stem to react and to produce this large uh, protective home for the developing fly larva. Um, the fly is uh, in, inside of that ball, um, surrounded by its favorite food. I always kind of like to picture it. Um, it's surrounded by its its favorite food. You know, it'd be the same as if uh, we were encircled by a, a chocolate cake or a big pizza or wh whatever your hap uh, favorite food happens to be. Well, that little larva, its job is to just, you know, feed uh, and grow, um, molt a few times, pupate, and then exit. Um, Central to that whole strategy, uh, if we go back here, look at how round this exit hole is. That little larva has to make sure that it chews an exit tunnel, and then it will usually plug that hole up with something so that it's uh, virtually invisible. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's essential that it does that as a larva when it has chewing mouth parts, because by the time it's an adult, the fly doesn't have chewing mouth parts. So there's no way it would be able to get out if it didn't make that tunnel ahead of time. Well, um, birds uh, recognize these galls as a source of food. This is the work, I'm gonna guess this was maybe a, a downy woodpecker or possibly a chickadee uh, that did this excavation in the winter time. Um, chickadees will sometimes pound into these. Those are both small birds and they're able to alight on these plant stems and uh, do that digging without um, having the stem tip over and, and break off, uh, as would be the case if it was a larger sort of uh, woodpecker or excavating type of bird. But um, you can see this hole is not nearly as neat and round as the exit hole of the insect, uh, insect made hole. Uh, so this was predated. Uh, in that book, um, Thoreau's Method, they also talk about, the author also talks about how there's a whole ecology around these gall, um, these galls, even after uh, the fly, if it's lucky enough to mature and leave, or if it gets eaten, that that cavity that's created there is very useful for different types of spiders. Uh, there's a little micro community that forms within the frass that's left behind by the developing larva. Um, so there's there's all kinds of cool things going on inside of there, even though to us, in fact, some people look at those and they think, oh, that's so ugly. Look what happened to that poor plant. Look what that insect did to it. But there is a microcosm of life going on inside that plant stem. Now, all the more reason to, to leave them up if you can, because um, there is a, a world of life going on 
inside there. Uh, these plant stems, um, again, this, this idea of, of protecting homes for uh, insects, in particular our native pollinators, has really taken off in recent years in the form of these bee houses. So if, if um, you can't or you don't, if you don't have uh, the vegetation, uh, maybe, maybe you know, live in a condo or something, um, and you, you don't have any vegetation to uh, conserve for pollinators, you might want to look at a bee house, a small bee house, I should say, a, a large bee house, kind of like the one we have at Hickory Knolls, um, can actually start to um, have some negative effects on um, bee populations. What we've seen over the last few years is when you create um, a large sort of unnatural gathering uh, spot for many types of pollinators, you're also going to create um, a, 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 an attraction for predators. Uh, we've had uh, mice uh, sometimes living in our large bee house. We've also had spiders move into our large bee house. I've also read that a large uh, bee house like this can also um, help foster the spread of disease. Say if a, if a sick bee comes in, if it's carrying some sort of a virus or maybe uh, some ectoparasites, those types of things can spread more ra rapidly, which is um, not something a solid, normally solitary bee is going to be very well equipped to, uh, to deal with. So uh, using caution uh, with these little guys here um, and Sticking. If you want to put up a bee house, I still think they're they're good things, but just don't go crazy with them. Make sure they're they're small enough that um, you're not creating an unnaturally large gathering for our pollinators, lest something should go wrong. Now, uh, the Xerxes Society is a fabulous resource for anything pollinator related, um, and they have a, a neat article. It's called "Where Do Pollinators Go in the Winter Time." Um, here you can see inside this uh, plant stem here on the left, um, that's the work of a leaf cutter bee. Um, they will provision, um, they make little cells inside the stem and they provision that with a uh, little uh, nectar and pollen balls for their uh, upcoming uh, brood. Um, that's a little peak inside of a plant stem. And then over here on the right, I mentioned before the leave the leaves movement. Here's a uh, bumblebee that is looking for um, uh, some overwintering habitat, or maybe she's going to start um, this year's colony and is looking for a place where she can dig in. But anyway, um, leaving the leaves will definitely foster uh, these insects and many, many more. Now, uh, last week I said we were going to talk about erratics. And by erratics, in this uh, sense of the word, I'm talking about glacial erratics. Um, if you've uh, done any reading or studying about the history of Illinois, you know that way back when, and we're talking about probably 10 to 15,000 years ago is when the last ice age ended and the glaciers melted and, and retreated along the way. Well, as they were uh, gaining uh, momentum, as they were growing, um, they were picking up lots and lots of material along the way. Um, sand and gravel, uh, boulders, all these sorts of things kind of became part of that giant ice sheet. Um, this shows actually a couple of different uh, glaciations. The, the most recent one was the Wisconsin Glacier, and it uh, kind of came down stopped about midway through, a little bit past midway through Illinois. And you'll notice that over here in Northwestern um, Illinois, we call that the driftless area. Um, Northwestern Illinois and Southwestern Wisconsin, Northeastern Iowa and Southeastern Minnesota, it's all part of what we call the driftless zone where um, the glaciers didn't touch it. So, um, that's, that area was unaffected by these massive ice sheets. But around here, the rolling hills that we have, the Campton Hills um, is all glacial deposits. Hickory Knolls, the knolls of Hickory Knolls are all uh, owe their existence to uh, the action of those glaciers. Well, as the glaciers retreated, all that material started to, to, to come off and it formed um, things like eskers and moraines and uh, canes. 
um, those are some of the names for those, those hilly formations that we have today. Well, sometimes the material is really large. Um, this is a photo I took over at um, St. Charles Park District's uh, disc golf course, which is uh, just a little bit uh, north and a little bit west of uh, the Hickory Knolls Discovery Center. It's on the north side of Campton Hills Road. It's a wonderfully rich glacially, um, uh, it's full of glacial deposits. In fact, it probably connected to the knolls on the south side of Campton Hills Road uh, before there was a road there. Um, that's all part of the St. Charles End Moraine. Well, here's a giant hunk of granite um, that fell off uh, as the, one of those glaciers uh, was retreating. You can see by the size of my foot here, I thought um, putting my lip balm on it wouldn't be, you wouldn't see it at all because this rock is so huge. So I used my foot instead. Um, but this is uh, one, uh, the, a pretty large example of a glacial erratic in this area. That's the term that's applied to these, these very, very large pieces that have fallen off the glaciers. Um, erratic, um, you know, you, if you think of that word, it, it's something unexpected. Um, as I mentioned before, this is granite. We don't tend to have granite as part of our natural geology here in Illinois. Um, the granite came down from, uh, say, northern Wisconsin and Michigan and southern Canada, and uh, then again, you know, plopped off as the uh, glaciers were receding. Um, I made a little video here so you of what the terrain is like over at the disc golf course. It's, it's pretty neat. It's a, it's a nice place to hike as long as there's not uh, discs flying through the air. This is actually a pretty good time because I don't think a lot of people realize the course is open yet, but there's some, some pretty good hills. Um, you can follow the course if you want, um, or you can uh, go off-roading like I did. Although, remember last week when we were talking about ticks, uh, I actually walked out of there with, with um, ended up with, with five deer ticks on me by going off the trail. So just a, a word of caution, you wanna prepare yourself if you, if you wanna go exploring, but um, it's all thanks to our glaciers that we have these hills and these wonderful uh, boulders we call erratics. So got a couple emails I wanted to run by you. Uh, some you might be able to relate to and you might actually be having similar issues. Uh, this gentleman wrote because he's having a vole infestation. We've lived in the same neighborhood in Crystal Lake for about 30 years and we've never had a single issue with voles ever. And this year, our yard and many neighbors' yards were hard hit by voles. What happened? What was, was the weather perfect? What the heck is going on? What can we do to stop it? Well, here's what he's talking about. Um, and maybe you've had this happen in your yard as well. Um, we kind of had um, a, we had a lot of snow. And whenever we have a lot of snow in winter, that really sets up uh, voles to have um, good uh, conditions to survive. It's kind of funny, you know, he sent this photo about um, the voles and the, uh, the damage that they left. Um, it looks too like he's got um, a hawk in the area that is eating, uh, well, it ate at least one bird. And I would suspect if there's hawks um, eating birds, there's probably gonna be hawks eating the voles too. So I don't think this is gonna be a lasting problem to answer. Uh, but I told him was, you know, this is, this is gonna go away now that the, the snow is gone as well. You might remember back in January, I talked about these uh, sorts of trails. This is, see the, the similarity between what we were seeing underneath the, what was at that time a thin layer of snow and what we see once the snow is gone. Uh, voles will, will follow these little trails back and forth in this area that we also talked about called the uh, subnivian zone or the subnivian layer. When the snow hits the ground, uh, it melts back a little bit and it creates about, a, about an inch, uh, inch tall space underneath the snow surface that all kinds of little creatures can run around in. Uh, and very few predators uh, stalk. Now, um, shrews will, uh, and shrews are predators, they will be under there. Uh, sometimes a weasel might try to hunt in the subnivian zone, but by and large, um, a lot of snow is going to give voles a, a free pass. Um, they are, are numerous, and if 
you have a yard. I, I, I haven't heard back from this person yet to find out if they feed the birds, but having a lot of bird seed in the yard will also increase your chances of having a lot of voles as well. So um, if it's something you're experiencing, there's not really you can anything you can do now other than um, you know, fill in those uh, tunnels and, and reseed them. Um, and then take measures to uh, cut back on uh, the, the free bird seed that um, might have drawn the voles to your yard in the first place. But it, it's a part of nature and nature will take care of it because as we've said many times, voles are nature's baked potatoes, everything eats them. So now that the snow is gone and I, I think it's gonna stay gone, I don't know, we still got April to get through, but um, if, if there's little snow cover, uh, there's going to be a lot more predation of these little guys. Now, um, I got another email and this one uh, was talking about one, look at all the turkeys that come and eat our bird seed. Um, and they gave a little census of uh, the sandhill cranes and 13 line ground squirrels, deer, crows, turkeys um, are coming to uh, the bird feeders. Um, I, I didn't get a location on this person. So I'm not exactly sure uh, where they live. Um, looks pretty rural looking out the back window here. Um, looks pretty open. But uh, the other part of the email, I thought you guys might have some thoughts on. Uh, they found these feathers uh, in their yard along with this um, heel bone here. And they want to know uh, what it was. And I said, I don't know. Um, Could it have been a turkey? Um, but the, actually the bird I thought of first was barred owl. And I, I, rightly or wrongly, I have this connection between barred owls and turkeys in my brain. I think that's because I have a barred owl call that was sold um, actually for turkey hunters. Turkey hunters can um, use a barred owl call to produce what's called a shock gobble. Um, in the, they do that in the springtime, from what I understand. I don't know, I'm not a turkey hunter, but from what I understand, um, by making the sound of a barred owl, uh, that can oftentimes inspire a, a gobbler or tom turkey to uh, make a gobble in, uh, in response to the sound of that, that barred owl sound. And um, it will help the hunter then get a, an idea of a location of where that gobbler might be. So um, I don't think they're gonna send me the, uh, the breastbone. <laughs> Here, I think they're only gonna send me the feathers, but um, I would sure appreciate any, uh, anybody's input uh, who might have an idea of what these feathers might be. Um, Cause I'm, I'm kind of curious too, but apparently they're, they're, they're gonna be mailed to me. So if I get them in person, we'll share them at a future good natured gathering. Um, so this is a cool resource. Um, in this particular case, um, I, I haven't, really had a chance to do a deeper dive beyond um, barred owl, which was the first bird that, that came to mind. But the uh, US Fish and Wildlife Forensics Lab has what they call the feather atlas. And this has grown quite a bit over time. Uh, if you find feathers, particularly wing feathers, um, uh, you can use this to try and, and identify uh, what you found. This is the, the homepage. Um, and you can just Google um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Feather Atlas. Um, further down on the page, you'll have these options. You can just browse through uh, the scans that they have of the feathers. Uh, there's over uh, 400 species that they've gathered now. And, and, and the, like I said, the, the uh, collection keeps growing. Um, you can um, uh, browse, you can search, uh, you can use this to identify by typing in different characteristics, like it has spots or it has bars or it's brown or it's black. Um, so you can use uh, different features of the Feather Atlas to try and figure out what it is that you found. It's a cool resource. Um, I thought you might enjoy it as well. This is what you get when you fill out um, any one of those sections. Like in this case, I just searched for barred owl. There's actually, I think there were three different photos. Uh, they were showing the, the primary and the secondary uh, feathers on the wings for the bird at all. Um, so anyway, it's a cool resource, something you might find useful yourself. Uh, now, next week, um, I, spoiler alert, I wrote about grackles. So uh, you'll be reading about those later this week, and then we'll talk about them next week. 
Um, the topic of ash trees has come up and uh, Katzers, you might um, know a little something about that. We're gonna talk about ash trees in this area, a little bit of what's been going on with them and uh, some of our more unusual varieties. Lots of spring discoveries are popping up. I didn't, uh, it's hard to tell just how many uh, we'll be able to share next week, but I've got a whole big long list already and it's only Tuesday. Um, more fun reader emails and you just never know what's gonna happen. So um, hopefully see you then. Uh, I'm gonna stop the share now because I've got a couple of things uh, I wanted to sh uh, show you. Uh, one is something that I picked up um, during that ramble there in the disc golf. And I'm gonna show it to you the way it looks now. Uh, can you see what's growing on this? This is a, a little branch from an oak tree. Um, this is a fungus called wood ear and it's in its dried out state right now. Um, it's uh, when we get our rains that um, we're actually getting drier by the day here. Usually when spring comes, the spring rains will cause these uh, wood ear fungus to fluff up. Um, they're actually a type of fungus. Uh, they're in a group called the jelly uh, fungi, and they, they get flappy, uh, just like um, not so much jello, but um, you know, the when you make jello eggs and you use like twice as much jello, so it's a much firmer gelatin. That's, that's the consistency of these. Um, they're reputed to be edible. I have never tried one, and I never recommend anybody try things until I've tried it and survived first. But um, if you look it up, uh, there are recipes for uh, wood ear fungus online. And this is something you can walk right by it, not even realize it's there, but it's, um, its job is to uh, break down the fungus. And when it's wet, it is really fun to just kind of flop back and forth because they are very floppy. Um, there's another common jelly fungus in this area called uh, witch's, I think it's called witch's butter. And it's that same uh, squishy consistency squishy and flappy and jello-like, uh, but it's bright yellow as butter is. So keep an eye out for those because this is happening in our woods right now. And then, um, let's see, I had uh, a visit. Kay, I'm sorry I missed you, but um, we're gonna do a little unboxing here. I got, um, I got a somewhat frantic phone call today from Connie Kerr. She's the receptionist over at the Baker building. And she said, Pam, Something came for you. Um, I don't know if you can read on the lid here, but I'm thinking, Kay, that this is a reference um, to dining room spider. That was the grass spider whose adventures we'd followed as she lived on my dining room table for several months. Well, this is a uh, garage spider. Um, Connie said that um, she's pregnant and I don't know, Mary, uh, Kay, if, if uh, you told her that or, um, if she actually looked in here, but I'm going to take the lid off. And I've actually got a, um, a little container here. I'm going to see if I can get her out. We're going to see what kind of spider has come to stay here at Good Natured World Headquarters. Oh, there she is. Um, oh, you know what? She's really little. Um, come on, sweetheart. Hey. Um, this looks like what we would call a, um, a house spider, which um, they do live in garages all the time. And they, they're the spiders. We can identify them. Um, their markings are very, very um, variable, but their um, egg cases are not. They're very, their egg cases are always shaped like a teardrop. Um, you know, this might take me a minute. So while I fuss with uh, garage spider here, um, Silvana, are you here? There you are. Hey, Silvana. Yes. Would you care to tell us where you were this past week? So we actually um, went to Shawnee National Forest for the first time. And it was something that I wanted to do for a very, very, very long time. And as part of the Master Naturalist program, we get these emails. And I got an email last week, no, the week before, 
and he said, oh, the migration of snakes. And my daughter has a snake and we're like, let's go. <laughs> so we went specifically to look at the snake migration. And um, so we spent a whole week over there and try four different campgrounds. And it was absolutely amazing. And I can't believe I had not been there before. Because <laughs> it's so close. And I highly, highly recommend it to everybody. If you don't camp, there's beautiful cabins all over the place. So I'm sure you can find something. So Silvana, you, so Snake Road is um, a big part of, was that a big part of your stay down there? Snake yes. So we actually stayed at the Pine Hills. You gotta be careful because there's Pine Ridge and Pine Hills campground. So Pine Hills is the one on the west side of the park. And it is the closest one to the Snake Road. Uh, another thing that I didn't know about because I, my plan was to get there uh, on Sunday and no, on Saturday and then get a map and then go and do you know all the hikes and try to figure it out because you get pieces and bits on the website but you don't get the full map and you mm -hmm. have to buy it from them and because it was a last minute type of uh, trip we didn't get enough time to order the, the map and then we went to the ranger station that is in Johannesboro. I don't know how to pronounce that. I think that's the name of the town. Uh, but they were close. And so it was like, great, I don't have a map. And so I got seriously lost finding the snake road. But we found it um, after a lot of getting lost in the gravel road. And it is just like they, they uh, put it on the email. You, you get into these beautiful bluffs and then you park your car and it's close to um, cars and bikes. And so you can go walking and as soon as you walk in, I mean, within two minutes of walking on the snake road, we start seeing snakes. Yeah. Um, and well, and, and snake road is actually, it's a forest service road. I think it, it's, it's, I know it's a sequence, like forest road 345 or something. And the, the history behind it is that um, people used to, to uh, drive down that road to see how many snakes they could run over. Oh. And, it's a, it's a gravel road. It's not, and some of it has been washed out over the years. I don't even know if it's possible to drive from, from one end to the other, but. I think you can, and they just close it from March um, 15th through May 15th. The rest okay. of the time is open for traffic. But at this time, they just put these bars at both ends of the road. Yes. And you have to park your car at the end. And there's one side of the road, that, the one that is more north, you can park maybe 10 cars or something like that. And there's mm -hmm. also like this inspiration point uh, area, but it was completely flooded. So you couldn't even get to it. So everybody's mm -hmm. trying to park here and trying to climb over there. So it was a very small parking spot. And gotcha. then the other side, you can maybe three cars can park. Well, and it's, it's if, if you want to have a perfect setup for reptiles and amphibians, you, you couldn't ask for a better spot than there because one side of the road is bluffs. Right. That's the uh, overwintering habitat. And then the other side is the marshy swampy area, which is right. where they get all fat and happy over the summer. And yeah. um, it's, I, I've been there a few times, spring and fall. Um, it seems like the animals have, um, almost a, a different aura about them in the springtime they they've made it through the winter but they're hungry they're kind of skinny they know they need to mate so they're you know they've got all these things on their mind and and um you know they're moving too in the in the fall when they're heading back it to me it seems like a much more relaxed sort of migration in the fall because they're they're kind of fat it's been warm for a long time. Um, they're, they're not in any particular hurry. Um, it's just, it's, it's a really cool thing if, if you're into uh, reptiles and amphibians. Silvana, did you see any, any venomous species while you were there? Yes, <laughs> yes we did. did you see? <laughs> so we got to see um, like eight of the water moccasins. Okay. And they're not little, <laughs> they're pretty big. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we didn't see any rattlesnakes. We really wanted to see one, uh, but we didn't see any. We heard people that were talking and saying that they had seen some. Um, we particularly, we didn't see that. We did get to see warm snakes, 
and we got to see garter snakes and rat snakes. Okay. Uh, very, very large rat snake. And it wasn't on the gravel road. It was on the bluff climbing. I actually okay. have a picture. So if, if you have time, I'll show it to you. But um, that I've never seen. So like this limestone is sticking out and the snake goes in between the cracks. And if my kids stretched their arms out, it wouldn't have been enough for the snake. It was wow. that large. And so I'm freaking out and this whole thing is just... So you see the head and it's just the, on the bluff going like zigzagging basically its body and then the tail, well, the last part of it drops. And it's like, where does it end? And <laughs> they didn't seem like they care for people. They just, they were yeah. crossing the road, minding their own business. Now the water moccasin will open its mouth. I mean, like, you know, like that, um, but no sound. So if you didn't pay attention, you can step on one because they are quiet and they're not fast and they don't move very much. And yeah. they just keep on going when you're, when they're done looking at you or whatever they're doing. So it was pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. It, you know, I, so I've been there a few times. I went once or twice without a guide, but the other times uh, there used to be a program through the uh, Illinois Natural History Survey. And I believe now uh, that Illinois Audubon offers it. Uh, there's a, a couple, Michael Jeffords and Susan Post, they used to work for the survey and now they're retired and they do these trips through Illinois, mm -hmm. but um, they will, they have connections with um, some of the state herpetologists and everything. And the, so they would arrange these, these tours of that area and we go along and the herpetologists would go and they would, they would, you know, pick up these, these venomous species or they would, you know, they would go and wrangle, like if they saw something up on a bluff, they would go and get it. Um, that was the, the first, actually the only time I've ever seen a hognose snake in the wild. And, and hognose snakes, um, their, their nose is, is tipped up a little bit on the end, like a, like a pig. And they have this, this bizarre behavior where when they're um, threatened or, or um, you know, they, they feel like they're gonna get eaten, they play dead mm -hmm. and over on their back. And they even stick their little tongue out. <laughs> you know, they, they kind of, you know, really ham it up. And if you turn them back right side up, they flip over again. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really dead. I'm really dead. And it's just, it's a really, really awesome experience. Sylvan, I was so thrilled to find out that you were able to go there. Well, and then, so we went and we we're very spontaneous here. <laughs> so we're like, get in the RV, let's go. And, and that's really how it happened. So we decided on Thursday and then we left on Friday, uh, yeah, on Saturday. And we were just kind of like, well, why not? And so we actually went to the snake road the first day we got there, but it was kind of getting late. And we seriously walked maybe five minutes and then we started seeing snakes. We saw four snakes and I'm like, it's getting late and I don't want to be walking around here with snakes. So let's go back tomorrow. So we went to our campsite and the next day we, re we returned and then we saw like eight of them plus the other ones. And it was just too many for us. So we were like, okay, maybe, maybe a full day in the middle of the day. And it's supposed to be just the beginning of the yeah. migration. So, and we didn't go with a guide. So we weren't searching for them. They were just there. Um, yeah. and that's like, everybody wear boots and stay in the middle of the gravel. Don't go to the leaves. I don't know what you're going to find. And they were right on the gravel road. Yeah. So then after that, like we decided to go and explore all their... Uh, sites of the park. The park has, I think it's seven or eight campgrounds. Okay. So we stayed at the one by the La Rue Pine Hills campground. And then we also stayed at the uh, Glendale Recreation Area, which is by the lake, which is okay. beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. And we got to see that the trees being eaten by the beavers. So yeah. you get the, that's, you know, our glass kind of shape uh -huh. we got to see two of those trees and it has beautiful walk around the lake and then we went to the garden of the gods that has another campground there called the pharaoh's campground and yeah. that just oh my gosh this is illinois like really like, like in what? another country isn't it down there yeah and then the last one so we stayed there for a couple of nights and then we moved to um the one that's called pine ridge which okay. is by rim rock Mm -hmm. And then we got to see that too. And when you're on those rocks that are ginormous and you're like getting in this little, oh gosh, I, I've never imagined that. So I, I was explaining to some of my friends when I came back, like, what is that like? And I'm like, 
it's kind of like you take star rock and you multiply it by a (laughs) hundred. So maybe something like that, like a lot, a lot of going on with a lot of animals. So we really liked it and we're hoping to make it out there again in April and definitely in the fall to see the difference with the snakes going back. So. Well, you know, I always kind of gauged in my head tax time, April 15th was a good time to go. But uh-huh. the last time I went down there on April 15th, we missed it because it had warmed up so quickly. So I wonder okay. if the ideal time to visit there is maybe gradually shifting earlier in the year. Well, and then to, to, to just, you know, point it out, like, I don't even remember who it was that told me that there were armadillos in Illinois. Yeah, I saw two dead ones. No way. Okay, that's a change too. And I mean, the road is just one road, right? And you have to go back the same way to get to your car. We walk right next to the armadillo. I took a picture, sent it to my dad. My dad is like, don't touch it. Those carry leprosy. And, and I'm like, okay, I won't touch it. He knows my kids. They will like try to. Yeah. <laughs> By the time we got back, it was gone. I couldn't have missed it. It was in the middle of the road. It was gone. And there wasn't that many people. So it wasn't like people kicked it. And we walked the whole two and a half miles and back. And oh. the spot what it was, like I kept looking for it coming back and it was gone. It was gone. Something took it. What? And it wasn't human. I know it wasn't human. <laughs> so it was just like surprise. And then on the drive from one of the campgrounds to the other campground, a bald eagle comes to the road and eats something. I'm like, that's a bald eagle. Like, this is wild here. It was, it was a really amazing trip. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Silvana. You know, um, let's see, this would have been, um, I think, Memorial Day weekend. And this goes back ooh, over 20 years ago. But I was down there um, when there was a, a periodical cicada emergence. Mm-hmm. And the box turtles were everywhere because here's this this tremendous influx of protein <laughs> and box turtles you know love to eat bugs and you just walk I was so worried there were so many that were so close to the roads I don't know how many ended up getting run over but there were box turtles everywhere so I don't know down in that part of Illinois I forget what brood it is but they're on a 13 year cycle not a 17 year cycle but oh, okay. it'd be worth checking into that and going down there uh, to see that as well, because it was just my, see, even if they weren't eating, you'd find box turtles that would have like cicada crumbs, you know, oh, no. here, or a leg over here. I know, but, I, I, it, it sounds gruesome, but I was like, an armadillo, it's dead, so they're here. <laughs> that was so exciting. <laughs> and then we saw another one, I was like, yeah, they really are here. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Well, Silvana, thanks so much for your, for your report like that. And, um, Again, anybody who uh, is looking to make that trip, now is the time uh, because that- well, Wait till it's after spring break, because I will tell you the camp, you know, if, you're, if you're going camping, because uh, we got to the oh, campground at the break. Garden of the Gods on yeah. a Wednesday in the morning, and there's 12 sites there, and that's the best campground you, you can stay. It's beautiful, and you just walk to the Garden of the Gods. You do all the hiking. The Indian Point is right there. Everything is really close, but- we got there before, I don't know, 11 o'clock. By noon, it was full. Oh. And it was Wednesday last week, no spring break. I cannot imagine how busy it is this week. Good point. Yeah. Good point. I don't tend to think like that. So, all right. Yeah. So keep that in mind as well. Don't yeah. go. No, no, don't go yet. <laughs> Wait a little. Maybe you get to see a green. Oh, That's too. what I wanted to see, but we didn't get to see one. So I, I <laughs> got to go back to try that. Awesome. Well, thanks, Silvana. It's great to see you again. Welcome back. Oh, I miss you. (laughs) All right. Anybody else have any questions? Oh, I see we got some chats over here. Hold on. Let me uh, get that pulled up here. Uh, So Jerry said that she found her uh, muskrat um, uh, near Lawrence Avenue by the water pumping station there. And would cup plant stems be big enough for native beads? Absolutely. In fact, um, the native bee house uh, that we have at Hickory Knolls, a lot of sections are filled up with cup plant stems. So they absolutely are. Um, Sarah, you ask a great question. Why do the glaciers not cover the driftless area? I would imagine there was some sort of geology that 
pause. I know there's a big bend. Isn't there a bend in the, well, that probably wouldn't be enough to stop the ice. I don't know. I'll have to see if we can investigate that and, and cover that in a, in a future good natured hour. Um, and uh, owl feathers are serrated, right? Well, it's, um, the, you know, the first, uh, the leading edge of the, the primary feathers has like a comb like edge to it, but the other ones don't because they, they lay there behind that serrated edge. Um, but they do tend to be fluffy at the bottom of, of an owl's whole body is kind of like a muffler. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to get those feathers and uh, we'll, uh, once they arrive, we'll see if we can do a little forensics of our own. Um, anybody else? Any questions, comments? Uh, Betty, great to see you. <laughs> Haven't seen you in a while. Happy spring break. Um, I do have a question. And, yes. And it might just be not, it's just my thinking here. You were talking about the erratics and, yeah. and I do have some in my yard because I'm neighbors with the this. You're this practically, yeah. yeah. I'm right there. But my question about the erratics is that is it just certain specific types of rocks that would have been deposited or could I find like all kinds of rocks? Can I find I limestones as erratic or just like igneous rocks? I think, um, I think you can find different kinds. In fact, um, on the uh, Illinois, uh, I think it's the Illinois State Geologic Survey website, they have a picture of what is the large, what's considered to be one of the largest erratics in Illinois. And it doesn't look, it's, it's south of here. And it doesn't, it looks to me like a sedimentary rock. So I, I think it's whatever they picked up and moved um, and, and dropped down. So if like, you know, by the St. Charles Post Office, there's two really big rocks that I kind of think, and they, they look like sedimentary rocks as well. They're, they're right on the, um, the northern, they probably when they were building the post office. In fact, there's one that was um, part of the till that was uh, brought up um, when we were building Hickory Knolls and it was so large, they broke some equipment moving it. <laughs> but it's, I would say it's four feet square. It's pretty big and that's a sedimentary rock as well. So yeah, the glaciers can move stuff around, but the the erratic, like when you see a, a, a hunk of granite, uh, then it's definitely erratic because it's it, it's something that wouldn't normally be found here. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else? Um, if not, uh, great to see everybody. Bundle up these next couple days, but then get ready for, uh, I think they're calling this second winter, uh, but we'll be back to springtime this weekend. So be sure you get out and enjoy it and uh, hope to see you back next week. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Ms. Bye. Pam. Thanks. And thanks, thanks Savannah. Pam. Thanks, You're Savannah. Welcome. That was really great. <laughs> great to see you, Chris. <laughs> Bye. Thank Take you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Pam. Bye, Laura. <laughs> Here we go.